Rosario Dawson, keep clapping, keep clapping. Daredevil, girl keep clap. clapping. Ooh, ooh. Rosario, thanks so much for being here. Um, Some gum? Be, mm, yeah, just put I'm it down be. right there. There we go. Yeah, I'm so yeah. happy to be here. <laughs> just trash the place. We don't care. It's me. okay. I'm gonna start uh, kicking over chairs. Lower East Side Girls Club of New York. Yes. I imagine. Well, because you're here talking about it, but that this organization is very near and dear to you. You grew up on the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. You were discovered there. It's one of my favorite movie stories. Is your discovery by Harmony Crane and Larry Clark mm -hmm. catch you on a, catch you on a stoop, right? Mm -hmm. Were you a part of the Lower East Side Girls Club around that time, or did it come Didn't to you a little later? Didn't exist yet. Oh. Um, and so I'm very proud to be a part of the Lower East Side Girls Club now because I would have loved to have had that when I was a kid. There was a lot of dropout, high, very high dropout rates, very high teen pregnancy rates, and there was no alternative for a lot of these girls. There were boys clubs in the community that failed to turn into... Um, co-ed um, spaces, even though all, a lot of the boys clubs across America had turned into boys and girls clubs. These ones vehemently declined, really? and vehemently so. And so it's really interesting to me, the people who came together, including Lynn Pentecost, who has sons, she doesn't even have daughters, um, who helped to create this space. And you know, pretty much 20 years later, we've got 30,000 square feet of awesomeness. We've got our own planetarium. We've got an airstream that was lifted into the building while it was still being constructed onto the second floor that's been gutted and turned into a studio, a recording studio for WGRL, which is super awesome. Hannah Bronfen was just there. I saw her Snapchats. It was pretty awesome. So it's just an amazing place. I love bringing people there because you hear girls club and people think rec room. And then you walk into this space and you're like on a college type campus or what you would imagine when you go into like the AOL offices or Google offices or something like that. Like it's really a destination and it's for these girls. It is for low income girls, there's no payment and it's on Avenue D right in the neighborhood and they also opened it to boys. All these years later, even though the boys weren't including the girls all those years you know, ago, you know, there's thousands of kids who come in all across from students that come in from different classes all throughout the week to take advantage of this incredible space. Did it evolve into what it is now? Or was it all, was, was the initial vision always going to be like, let's make it like a college campus. Let's make it like not a rec room, but a learning facility for people of the, of the neighborhood. Well, uh, Lynn and a couple of folks got the property and bought the property that the um, new building exists on many, many years ago and fought very hard over the years to keep it um, and finally develop it. And that was one of the things I was put to task to do is to help raise the funds for it. It was really awesome when we finally got there and wore our pink hard hats to do the groundbreaking on Avenue D and to see what's been created. You know, it was a, it was an, uh, a collaboration between the city and private investors and all different types of stuff. There's, you know, a development, so there's actual housing part, um, low income part, you know, um, uh, whatever rates, the normal rates. Um, and uh, uh, the, it's completely separated from the actual rest of the girls space. And it's just like three stories with a roof garden that has tech, it has a you know, bio bus, you know, they do everything from making clothing to food to um, you know, looking at insects and, and, you know, little microbes. You know, it's really completely diversified if you want to, for all the parades and everything and marches that they're always participating in. They were just in the science march, which I unfortunately missed them. I was in the science march, but I was a little bit further behind them. They'd made all these little lab coats. Um, you know, they can do welding. They can just do everything. And it started off in basements, in the backs of, you know, churches and, you know, in rooms that weren't being used in schools. You know, it was very piecemeal, just giving these services to these kids, and it's just grown and grown and grown. And so much of that is because of the community. There are these days where all the different bars will make all the, you know, anybody who's drinking, they can have like a happy hour, and all the money goes to the girls' club. They started a um, Sweet Things Cafe, they had a gallery, so it's very artistic. Um, there's health and food. There's there's uh, teachers who come in, nurses that come in from, um, from which college is it? The the nurses that come in. Hunter, right? Yeah, this Hunter College. So the they'll come in and they'll you know say you're really stressed out. You're taking on too much at school, so you know your prescription is to do some yoga and eat some vegan food. At they can the, also probably do theirs. Yeah, too, which right? is what, exactly that. It's like your, your prescription is to go into the, you know, take a dance class, do some yoga, go and have some healthy food in the in the cafe. You know, two boots pizza donated 
ovens so the girls can learn how to you know make pizza but also they're learning business they're they're getting skills that they can then turn into internships they've worked with every one from you know just incredible designers to cooks and chefs and it's just been really remarkable you can't not bring anyone there that isn't inspired and doesn't then want to feel like doing something there because it's like the part of you that's a kid that didn't get to experience something like that like when you're sitting in the planetarium on avenue d just zooming out into the known universe and back you're like, am I doing this on the Lower East Side? Like, are you serious? You know, the only other planetarium is at the Native, Na Natural History Museum. And the guy who runs that is like a total burner dude with super long hair, who lives in the neighborhood, who comes over all the time and just works with the kids and shows them the whole thing and, you know, talks about how you have to be really particular about how you talk about science and exploration and, and you know, going out into the planets because it can make kids feel insignificant. Or it can make them feel like, well, if we're just a speck on the wall, then, you know, do I have to do my homework? <laughs> you know, so it's really important to just have incredible people like that who get that this is an opportunity to reach out to kids and maybe show them their calling. Maybe show them things that they could be really passionate about. And it's been really, really beautiful to see how it's developed and grown and been embraced and, and thriving. When did you decide, having grown up on the Lower East Side after gaining some success in, in, in movies and television, when did you decide that it was time to give back and start giving back and working on projects like this? Um, well, I think it's, um, I mean, I grew up in a family that participated, you know, in different ways and engaged in different ways. You know, my grandmother used to, you know, my great grandmother worked at the Ladies International Garment Workers Union with my grandmother. That's awesome. And then, which was super awesome. And then they had labor issues and all types of things. So they used to walk in marches and they used to bring my mom in tow. And my mom used to bring me in tow to all the different marches that she went to and participated in for especially growing up in New York with the HIV and AIDS epidemics and the drugs um, that were taking over. Um, the housing issues, just everything. You know, I, my first campaign was to try to save trees when I was 10. Of course, I made posters, which was completely against what I was trying to save trees and waste paper. Um, That's like a bad joke about liberals <laughs> that some jerk Republican would make. You know, I was 10, all right? So I was trying. Um, but, you know, it's, it, I was encouraged, and I think that that's really important, and these girls are getting encouraged, and the community is being encouraged from that, and, you know, it, it just grows and grows and grows. There's sister organizations in New Orleans, in Glasgow, Scotland, in Nepal, in Sierra Leone, in Chiapas. Like, they're, this is far-reaching, and um, it's preparing these girls for the world that we're coming into contact today, where they're gonna need these skills, they're gonna need to be in these spaces that they feel ownership in, and feel good in, and are thriving in, because then that's gonna be their expectation when they go forward, and that's what we need to be engaging our kids in and, and, and supporting them and, and, and pushing them for their own expectations of themselves. You also said you know, participation at the beginning of that and we talk about this as an organization and how important that is to have organizations that you can participate in, your community that you can participate in. The Lower East Side has changed a lot in the last 25 years. It's been heavily gentrified, which is a lot of you know, private money and there isn't as much of organizations like this anymore and community participation. It must be incredible to be able to continue to give this to people who are still in the community who need it. It's, you know, one of those things that I remember, I, I, I worked with the organization for a lot of years before I actually joined the board. And when the building was being constructed, they were like, you have to join the board, Rosario, you helped to make it possible. Um, but for me, it was always just about, I just kept coming into contact with kids in the community when I'd come to visit or I was in the, around and they'd go, oh, you're so lucky you got out. And that always really bothered me because I, I loved growing up in the Lower East Side. I grew up in a squat, um, which had been an abandoned building. And you know, had we, my parents not had the tenacity to actually develop and, and work within the community and work within the building and do that sweat equity so that we could live in Manhattan, I never would have been discovered on that stoop. You know, I probably would have lived out in deep Brooklyn, deep Manhattan, you know, deep Bronx, deep, you know, wherever, and I, and I would have missed that opportunity. And opportunity is everything. Um, and so I'm really grateful to be a part of an organization that reminds all of those girls that this isn't a place you have to escape and get away from. That this is some, a place that a lot of people have grown and thrived in. People come from all around the world to come to the Lower East Side, to see St. Mark's, to see this is, his, it's a historical space and they should feel proud to come from there. Now we keep mentioning this story. I don't know, if, does everybody know the story about how Rosario was discovered? I mean, do you mind telling it? I've heard it, I love this story. Like, you, you love it, you love the story, let me hear it. <laughs> 
You want me to tell the story? <laughs> no, well, I want to hear you tell it. I'm so curious. Two of my favorite filmmakers, Harmony Korine and Larry Clark, were in the midst of pre-production on Harmony's first script and Larry's first feature film, I write, since, yeah. since his photography. Yep. Uh, a movie called Kids in 1996. Mm -hmm. uh, an incredible film uh, produced by Carrie Woods, I think, right? Mm -hmm. And they saw you sitting on a stoop. Mm -hmm. And uh, was it Harmony or Larry that saw you? There was actually a whole group of them, including the cinematographer, everybody. They were scouting for locations, so they ended up shooting down the block, which when you look at it, it's almost unrecognizable because new buildings have been developed and all types of things around. But um, they were just scouting, and then they saw me. And I auditioned. It wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like on the spot. You, like, you got the part. I wish, you know, like, you know, like everything. You got to hustle for it. So I went in. I remember it was not too far from here, it was just down Broadway, really close to Houston, and my dad pedaled me over on his bicycle, which he was very fond of doing um, when I was a kid, and I remember I think I just like on a t-shirt or something, like was sitting on the bar, and he like pedaled me out, and then parked, I remember he put the bike up on, on Houston Street, and we walked into the production office where I was doing my audition, and he was like, okay, this looks legitimate, because of course it's like weird when some, a group of men come up to your 15-year-old daughter and are like, hey, I'm making a movie, kid. <laughs> It's also, it's also Larry Clark, who's... Uh, <laughs> yeah, literally, who then, my dad's sitting in the, um, uh, like, waiting room while I'm doing the audition, and Larry leans out and goes, is that your boyfriend? I was like, that's my dad. <laughs> even a little you, clue into... And even if they had had Google then, and your dad, like, Googled Larry Clark and got his photos, Probably he would have been like, I don't know about yeah. this. Yeah. yeah, I know. Yeah, for sure. So No, but they read the script, and my parents are really cool, and they trusted me, and that's a really big thing. Um, that I had their trust and respect. I'd already been working for years doing babysitting and tutoring um, and shown myself to be really responsible. So they yeah, trusted really me. Really weighty role, too. That's yeah, I mean, they like completely small... trusted me. The only thing that they had notes on was that I was not allowed to smoke in the scene because my character was supposed to be chain smoking. All the dialogue and the insanity that happens in the rest of the movie, they were like, totally great, totally believe it, feels real. Like, we love that, you know what I mean? They're very, you know, they're, they're New Yorkers, but... They were like, you're 15, you're not allowed to smoke. I was like, all right, I'm glad that there's some parenting embedded into this. Because if you guys were just like, go ahead, I'd be like, question. I'd have to sit them down and have a little conversation. I'm like, have you read this script? So now this is your discovery. And then after this, do you decide that you, you do want to be an actress and you wanted to get involved more? And you, did you get an agent from the movie? Is that how it worked? Yeah. I, I, I moved, we moved to Texas. I think I got paid $1,000 to do the movie. And then we used, of course, that wasn't my money because I was 15, so my family used it. And we went on vacation to Texas. And then we moved there. I was supposed to be a two-week vacation, and then I was living in Garland and going to Garland High School. I was like, what just happened? Why? And um, because my dad was, you know, was raised there. He's from Colorado, but he was raised in Texas, and his extended family was there, and we were visiting, and my mom loved it and just wanted to get out of the city and all of that kind of stuff. And my grandmother just retired, and she was able to give us a little bit of money so we could get a house. And so we had that experience for a little while, which was amazing. But a year later... I start getting calls at the movie. They had screened it at Sundance at midnight and it had gotten really crazy and people were talking about it and Harper's Bazaar was doing this photo shoot and they wanted to fly me out. And I remember feeling like a pretty woman. I was like, they me a car, flying to New York. You know, I went by myself, it was amazing. Out to and LA or out back to New York? New York. Here okay. in New York. And, um, and then uh, I got an agent from it uh, and I just started, and then I was 16 years old when the movie came out in 96. And, um, my parents allowed me to move back to New York by myself. And I finished up high school and got roommates and did that whole thing. And, and then what was your second role? Uh, I did a, a, a couple like little indie stuff, but the big one that um, was like the, the big get was um, Spike Lee's He Got Game when I was 18. I did that on my senior year of high school. And I'll never forget, too, all the people that I was going to school with, they kept being like, yo, I just auditioned with Allen Iverson. Yo! And they'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, no, I'm doing a movie with Denzel. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then a year later, the movie comes out, and they're like, oh, snap, you in a movie with... I'm like, I was trying to tell you when it mattered, like when you could have visited set. What's wrong with you? <laughs> like one of the problems of doing a movie, it takes a year and a half for it to finish, so no yeah. one's going to believe you until it's, it's pretty much over for you. Yeah. And that's interesting. You know, I really looked back at that moment for a lot of years um, with regret because I had gotten um, accepted into a bunch of colleges and I decided to defer. I didn't get into the college I wanted to, which was Columbia, but I got into you know, Trinity and I got into USC and I got into all these really great schools, but I didn't want to go so far away. 
And I had done this movie and I was feeling myself and was like, I just did a movie well done, so I'm a, my, my phone's gonna be ringing off the hook. I ain't gonna have time for college. <laughs> did not work for a year um, until the movie came out and then slowly started being, I got a manager as well and then slowly it's just, you know, just did a lot of indie films and kind of just kept like pushing at it. But I'll never forget that window of feeling like I should have been in college, I should have been taking classes. You know, when I was in high school, um, we just had National Teachers Day uh, honoring teachers, and um, it, I had to say something. I, I didn't realize. I hadn't thought. I've been thinking about him for a long time, and I looked him up, and he'd actually passed away a couple of years ago. But Professor Conda Paracas, who was my pre- pre-calculus and calculus teacher at the Cooper Union before it looked like what it does now, because that was completely transformed, and he was just the most amazing teacher. Um, and I just, I thought for a long time, you know, I went, I took a civil engineering course at Columbia University one summer, and I just thought I was going to do all these other things. I was going to maybe do, be in math, I was going to be in science, I was going to be a marine biologist, I was going to be something else, because I knew this acting thing eventually, that, that you know, Apollo Hook was going to yank me off the stage and be like, uh, we have real people who, like, studied at Juilliard to take these jobs, and you need to get a real job. Even the Juilliard people, though, feel like someone with a hook is going to pull them out at some sure, point Sure, I've well. figured yeah. that out since, yeah, but, you know, it was, it took a lot, a lot, a lot of years for me to even accept what it is that I was doing and call myself an actor because I just felt so, you know, I just, I I grew up around starving artists. So for me, I just felt so grateful for the opportunity, but I I didn't see it turning into anything because it so often doesn't, you know? And I, but I just, I saw that the door was open and I kept my foot in it and I kept pushing and until someone slammed it in my face. And it's luckily a, it's been over 20 years. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange profession though too, where even if you are doing it, sometimes it's like sitting in a trailer for 11 hours and then doing it for an hour. And so you still have that feeling of like, I'm doing this acting thing, but like, what am I really doing? With like, my I, life. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I'm, I'm actually very much in that place right now. I've been, you know, um, dealing with a lot of loss lately and um, reconnecting with my family and my friends in a different way and realizing how much I've pulled myself back and I've been just really humbled by, you know, this opportunity tonight, they're giving me an award and it's recognizing all of the achievements and things that I've done with the organization, which is amazing. But I'm, I'm humbled by those achievements, but I'm also really humbled by my failures and the necessity to never take anything for granted and to constantly be working on yourself and take advantage of every moment because it, tomorrow's not guaranteed. And you wanna make sure that the people that you love know that and that you're doing things with your time that you're proud of because it goes by so fast and it's really easy you know, to get caught up in the minutia. But then you're sitting in the girls club and you're zooming out into the known universe and back and you realize it can, it can be so much bigger and so much more. Um, we're all ourselves the only ones who are stopping ourselves from having that. So I'm challenging myself still now. I wanna go back to school. I want to keep growing, I wanna keep learning, I wanna be a better person, I wanna manage my time better, I wanna be more organized, I, there's, there's, I just, I don't wanna be lazy and I don't wanna take anything for granted. And um, I'm grateful to work with people over so many years that even through my ups and downs, I've had this space um, wh- that's inspired me and moved me and challenged me. You know, I've directed some of the girls in I'm an Emotional Creature, Eve Ensler's book that was a follow-up to um, the Vagina Monologues. We've gone on marches, we've done these different things. I, I, I just, there's still so much more to do and I'm so grateful for this touchstone, even like as I'm going through a really emotional and stressful time in my life right now, I was so grateful to get on the plane, to come here today and be with all of you and celebrate what we have to celebrate because that's super important and it's too easy to kind of go down the wormhole, the rabbit hole and think about the stuff that didn't work and didn't happen and we need to do, like I saw Yoko Ono did this thing recently a couple months ago where she just posted all of these like little Yoko Ono-isms and they're just like things like, always go for a walk and keep your blood moving even when you're sick, you know? And like just really cute, really interesting things but really actually profound. And she was like, and if you do bad things, You know, if you mess up, if you fall, if you hurt someone, if you do something wrong, look at it and go, that was bad. And learn from it and keep it going. Don't don't mull in it, don't mire in it, don't lose yourself in it, don't. And I'm very hard on myself and I just want to celebrate. I wanna celebrate the fact that, you know, I'm coming up now, my my cousin just died, Vanessa, 
and I'm coming up on the six year anniversary of my grandmother's passing. Um, and it's from 75 to 26 there. You just don't know when your time is. And I just don't want to be in any kind of position where I'm looking back going, ah, oh, shoulda, coulda, woulda, didn't damn. <laughs> Do you think one of the reasons you're so proud and work so hard for the Lower East Side Girls Club of New York is because you think back, and you sort of said this at the beginning of the conversation, that you wish you had had a place like this when you were growing up. It's not school where you're sort of forced to go on a day-in and day-out basis, but it's a place where you can learn self-examination, examination of the world, politics, culture, all of this stuff, and it's a place to really expand your horizon so you don't get stuck on the Lower East Side or get stuck in your small part of Brooklyn or somewhere else that you might be coming from. Yeah, I mean, growing up in the Lower East Side, it was always a common joke, but it was very real that people wouldn't go past 14th Street. You know, people can very, you can really easily segregate yourself. And that doesn't necessarily mean anything. You don't have to necessarily lose out, especially in a place like New York, where within a five block radius, you pretty much do have everything that you need. But we need to still expand beyond just our comfort zone and challenge ourselves and learn more about ourselves. And that's what's so beautiful the opportunity that is at the girls club because you can learn more about yourself through your food and your habits. You can learn through more about yourself through music and DJing and not just looking and sitting in the planetarium but actually creating planetarium shows which there's a whole class for. You can take six week courses in pretty much anything and if you wanna, if you kinda did that in the science lab or in the fashion lab and you're like, you know what, I didn't love that, you don't have to continue on but if you do, you can keep getting in deeper and deeper and deeper and art is a huge part of all of it and I think that's just tremendously important because creation and beauty and ideas and that stuff moves people you know and we need to be moved we need to be inspired um, and I'm just so grateful to be a part of something that gets that mission and pushes all of us to keep it going because it's really expensive and it's really hard and it's 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 tough you know there's a lot of organizations falling by the wayside raising funds is really really difficult but what we have here is really profound. And if we can grow it and we can develop it and all of the, our sister clubs around the world could have a facility like we have here on Avenue D, the effects of that would be so tremendous. Um, and, and that's worth fighting for. So um, thank you, I have to say, for this opportunity to be talking about our beloved girls club um, to all of you out there watching because it's, it's something that we should be talking about. You know, we need that good news and we need something we know that we can support and give us inspiration to do other things. You know, it's not just, oh, that's nice, that's happening over there, but how does that inspire you to do something? What does that move you to do? Even if it is just to share more about it and maybe buy things from the girls club at Christmas and things when they're selling, just to support in some way. Um, even just liking it, it means so much for the girls because they're doing so many projects and the things that they're doing and putting it out there. And it means a lot to see people seeing it and appreciating it. Like the smallest to the largest gesture makes such a big difference because it's the person behind it and the energy behind it and the thought behind it that really counts. So never feel like your contribution is too small or that it can't be bigger if possible. <laughs> If you can, because I'm telling you, and, and the young girls' eyes that I've seen over the years and the graduates who then come back to work and the success that they're having, and it's, it's really, um, it's just profound, you know? It's, it's, um, there's so much going on in the world that's not okay, even a little bit, and we don't have to, we we don't have to elaborate it. on that, I think. I, mean, I think we all, yeah, I'm with you. I think we are all on that same page, just about, um, but, this gives me hope, and um, and it should give all of all of us hope. Um, Absolutely, and I'm so glad you came here to talk about it. Let's get some questions right Thank here. You. Are we? Do you guys want to give a round of applause first? I heard <laughs> heard that starting. I immediately cut it off. Sorry, everybody. Right here. Hi. First of all, it's Hi. nice to meet you. I'm nice Madison, you. and I'm a girl that actually attends the Lower East Side Girls Club. Um, and my question to you is, if you were my age or any age of any of the girls that attended Older? currently, I'm 16. Oh my God, girl, you're so cute. <laughs> um, but what would you think you would take most advantage of, of all the resources that we offer? Because I know there's a lot and it kind of be a little bit intimidating when you see it for the very first time. Um, so I just was curious to see what your interests would lie. When you go into the space, mm -hmm. I would definitely be all up in the planetarium for sure, because I just think that's remarkable. Um, the fashion lab has developed into something really, really beautiful. I just brought my friend Catherine Malandrino by, who's proper um, fashionista um, and designer and businesswoman. And she was really um, 
like impressed with just how organized and specific and thoughtful and prepared and the whole space was. She was like, this is legitimate space for making clothing and fashion and like this is this is this is a great this is better than most other places that I've seen that could really if girls want to get into this can really develop from I love the biotech lab I love the art space I mean I love the kitchen I love it in there um I love um you know the Kiki Smith art pieces around I think I think me personally, because I love to do everything. It's one of the things that I, you know, I'll, I'll be posting about different causes and people will be like, pick a cause. And I'm like, no, <laughs> they're all correlated. They all correlate, you know? Um, so I think I'd probably be just taking all the classes. I'd be so happy to, you know, just because it's after school and the, you know, the school that I went to is, um, were not so awesome. You know, they didn't develop very much. You know, I look at them now and I'm like, that looks like a prison yard. That's like just cement. There's like, that's terrible. You know, that that was my high school, that that was my elementary school. Housing you know? for eight hours, send them home. Yeah, and it's just, you know, and I had great teachers, thank God, you know, oftentimes who were spending a lot of their own money in order to make sure that we had the right supplies and things that we needed. And, you know, it, everybody did the best that they could, but this space offers something so much more and it would have been remarkable to, explore that so I could have really found my own way. I wonder sometimes had it not been discovered that I would have ended up where I am because I get so interested in so many things. Um, but I wonder because the, the avenues that are available in that space could really develop anything. You can really do anything. And what I love about it is that you can also do all of it. Right? Like, you don't have to choose one thing. And that's really beautiful, especially if you've been there for a few years. You can really take your time to explore all those different spaces. And that, that makes a, a great human. Next question. Who has a microphone? Oh. It's... Hi. Uh, sorry, I'm Markel. Um, big fan of all your work. Um, I wanted to ask, um, as you being an artist, um, were there any unexpected uh, lessons that you've learned through being an actress that... Um, has helped you to shape you to who you are today? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's hard to figure out just like one thing. I mean, I, I've really, I've grown up in this industry, you know, I've grown up there and it's been so fascinating to see, you know, I'm, I'm, I just turned 38, so like, I, 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 I say I straddle the, um, the centuries, you know, I remember very vividly last century and, you know, and everything that I was taught about it from the previous 1900s, you know, 1800s to the 1920s, the flapper 20s and, you know, Elvis and Jim Morrison and, you know, I can sit there and watch a, a, a little Twitter feud between, you know, um, Kim Kardashian and uh, Bette Midler and I know exactly who both of them are. You know what I mean? Like, it's so funny watching people in the timeline being like, who does bet? And I'm like, were you the person who thought that Kanye just discovered, um, what, what's his name, um, from the Beatles when uh, oh, yeah. they did that song with Rihanna, Paul McCartney? Paul McCartney yeah. And people were like, who's this Paul McCartney person? And you're like, what? Really? Wrong with you? Yeah, there was what? that happened. I remember when Missy Elliott was on the uh, Super Bowl, people were like, who is Missy Elliott? Like, she was new. I was like, Girl, get it. Just win over a whole new generation. You just do that. You know, so it's like, it's beautiful kind of being able to get like deeply who these different people are and just how significant and, diff and different that was and how remarkable it is that I got to do and explore so many things without feeling like I was being watched all the time and, and f videoed all the time. Like there was just a different sense of privacy and, and the invasion of privacy that I've learned about and how important it is to keep keep your own space is now something everybody feels to a large degree. And it's just been remarkable in my journey just to see that and be witness to that and how much that's changed film, how much that's changed art. You know, I, I was with, um, I was at a friend's birthday recently and there was a guy there who I'd never met before and he had been the owner, he was the head of this company um, called Electric Farm, I believe. And they were the head producers of the show that I did called Webisodic that I did called The Gemini Division. And this is before YouTube, before Netflix, before anything. And I remember these powwow meetings we would have, like, we got to make content for the internet, but how do people watch it? How do people make money? Like, it was, we were right in this weird window 
where people were getting access to technology, but all the software and everything wasn't there yet to really make it what we know today. And we were laughing about it at this party, like we were pioneers at a time that just, it didn't make any sense. And we were asking questions that eventually now everybody knows the answer to, but were weird questions to ask at the time. And we were in this weird little silo and we we're like, we're gonna make this little webisodic anyway, and maybe somehow, some way, some people will see it, we'll do what we can. But now it's like, you know, hey, well. <laughs> Isn't there something weird about the access to everything that people have, though? I mean, the way that you talk about it, it's like the person who doesn't know who Paul McCartney is has probably heard the Beatles, has probably heard Paul McCartney, but when we used to have to do it, and I hate to sound like that, but it would be like, what is this thing? Oh, I'm going to learn about it. I'm going to explore it. Now it's like, just click. I don't like it. I like it. I like it. There's very little actual exploration into, specifically artists, I think, sometimes. Um, I... I don't know. I think it really depends on the person. I think, you know, I watch a lot of people who are like a, the second something, they're like, what is that? They just look it up, you know, and, I, and they really take advantage of that. I remember having to do it the slow way at the library. Exactly. <laughs> I guess I guess <laughs> you know, find like, the slow so way. So it's pretty remarkable, and we have to constantly be reminded sometimes, you know, we'll ask, and we are, we're almost used to in that old time of being like, ah, I don't have an encyclopedia in front of me, so I guess I'll just have to wait on that answer. And it's like, wait, I actually have the world's known information in my pocket. Let me just ask right now. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a new habit and it's one that I think, you know, when I see people ask me silly questions online, I'm like, you know, the time that it took you to ask me that question online, you could have actually Googled it um, and gotten the answer. Um, but, you know, there is a little bit of a laziness, but to say that that's gen new to this generation and not, you know what not I mean? this like, generation, I would say. Or as just as an idea across the board, like, you know, that, that's, that's been a constant, you know, unfortunately our libraries, have not always been so full, um, and that's over generations, you know. So it's it's really interesting, you know. When people have a quest for knowledge, it's accessible. The thing that I find more fascinating about it is that people were really starved of information before. You know, there was only the elites, or the royalty, or you know, um, the leadership of the church that actually had access to the written word, and they disseminated information. They governed. And now we all have access to pretty much all the information all the time, whenever you want it. You know, people are having to re, re they're having to change how people are getting um, credits for their education because people are going online and they're studying stuff at two o'clock in the morning when it's convenient for them, and they should be they should get credit for that because they did learn something. Um, so it's like we're in such a different place now, but people are drowning in information. I think now. Um, in the same way that they were starved of it. So I think the extremes are really there. It's only going to get worse as people are, you know, are talking. You know, we've got, I mean, it, or not. Maybe it'll get even easier. You got, um, you know, Elon Musk talking about he's already working on for 10 years from now being able to um, send images to each other by our brains. Like just literally having our computer embedded or attached in some way to our, 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 our minds, um, whether biotechnology, whether it's just something that you wear or something that eventually probably you will embed, where that rather than having to describe something to you, I can just send you the picture, which of course begs the question of like people getting, you know, things that they don't want to hear or see and advertisements and all that kind of, kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a crazy world to think about, but like, <laughs> you know, I'm like, eh, flat hold on, hold on. That, you know? We're having a conversation. I'm getting an advertisement for mattresses. I'm just going to have to wait for I to have skip to wait this I, one. I have to wait Sorry. four seconds before I can skip ad. Yeah. yeah and like I'm back. And yeah. I'm back. Yeah. You know, so it's interesting, but like, this is the, the, you know, this is the world that we're going to full throttle. And, you know, I find that, it's really useful to pay attention to things as they're gradually changing because it's baffling if you check in every five years because it's, it's the your technology is going leaps and bounds. I mean, it was what, you know, Elon Musk says for that reason that we're probably going into the, you know, not the singularity, but like the, yeah, but like this, that we are in, you know, a simulation. And whether we are in it now or we're going to create it at some point, if we don't make ourselves obsolete, the only other direction we can go is most likely being in some kind of simulation where you're like, you know, on the holodeck and you can just really be in that space. And you, when you look at, man. Yeah, when you look at technology, I mean, it wasn't that long ago when, you know, our video game was, doop, 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 you know, and look at how much it's just developed in my lifetime. And that's, you know, that, that goes back when I think about for my grandmother when she would reminisce and talk about, from the radio to the television, black and white to color, like the, the, 
the evolution was over, was took a much longer time. It's happening. I mean, I, you wake up the next morning and you're like, ah, I got to get that. I have to update the app because it's completely new now. And also one, <laughs> one century is not that much time. We think of it like you say, the boop boop of the video game that was 40 years ago. That's very little time in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. The way things could change. Yeah, in a hundred years, yeah, we will be living in the Matrix. I believe that, absolutely. We'll have the, our brains will be know, plugged into the Koch brothers will be sucking the energy source out of the back of my brain and powering the simulation. Uh, I am my own battery. Uh, Rosario, it's been uh, such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for being here. The Lower East Side Girls Club of New York is on Avenue D, right? And anybody can go and check it out and yes, please. recommend that you do. Rosario Dawson, everybody, thank you so much. Woo!